Good afternoon and uh, welcome uh, back uh, to our Cybersecurity 2022 organized by the SO, NSOE and uh, ENCS. Our fifth edition uh, goes into the second uh, uh, section, which is a counter attacks and the strategies compromising uh, the European grids. And uh, it is uh, moderated uh, by the Director of Technology of ENCS, uh, Martin Hoove. You have the floor, Martin. You can present your panel and... Uh, Okay, Please. thank you. Thank you, Roberto. Yeah, so welcome everyone. I'm very happy to hear, be here with this panel. I think these are all colleagues of mine. We've been working together for a long time, I think, all on this network code on cybersecurity. It's coming up, and I'm very happy we can present this network code work also to, to the wider community uh, in, this, in this event. Um, so I think I've been working with people so long I forgot their official title, so I will read it from the, the uh, script. So to my left I have uh, Daiga, uh, Daiga Dega, who is a business security specialist at NSUI Secretariat. Uh, she's acting as the NSUI advisor to the Network Code on Cybersecurity, and she coordinates the Network Code Product Management and the Stakeholder Engagement. Uh, next to her is Olivier Clement. He is Head of Cybersecurity and External Affairs at Enedis. He has been part of the formal drafting team of Network Code at NSUI and EU DSO Entity, uh, where he focuses particularly on the information sharing and the exercises. And he's also chair of the excerpt group uh, for uh, cybersecurity at the EU DSO Entity, uh, where he's now helping to prepare for the implementation of Network Code. Um, and then we have two participants online in the panel. Uh, so we have Stefano Bracco from Acer. Uh, so he's security officer and knowledge manager at Acer. Uh, he's been taking part in the drafting of the framework guideline and, and he's one of the leading specialists at Acer during the drafting and revision process. Um, and we have Thomas Voboda, he's head of the cybersecurity department at uh, Chess Distribution, the, the ch uh, uh, Czech DSO. Uh, he's been part of the EDSO Task Force 4 that provided the EDSO input for the uh, network code during the drafting phase. And he's now also helping to prepare uh, the implementation as part of the TSO and DSO uh, drafting team. So welcome everyone. Yeah, so as, as said, we, we have been preparing as, as in the panel for quite some while uh, on this network code. Uh, I personally got involved already in 2019 when it was a smart grid task force export group two that already prepared some of the work. Then we had an informal drafting team in 2020. Uh, there Acer, Stefano and others, his team prepared the framework guidelines <coughs> in the beginning of 2021. And then on the 22nd of July uh, last year, actually NSUI and the EUDA's entity got a letter to prepare really the network code text itself. And I think last time this year, uh, th this time last year, actually we were in the middle of processing everything from the public consultations. I think we were very busy, but we managed to deliver. So the first draft text from NSUI EUDSO entity was presented uh, on 14th of January uh, this year. Then the pen went back to Acer, and they provi uh, provided their revision on July 14th. And now we're sort of in the final phase uh, where the commission is performing a review. I think the ambition is still to have the network code goes into force in 2023, so next year already. Um, so in a way, we're almost at the finish line, but in another way, I think that the work is really just beginning with the implementation. And I think the implementation, it, it will affect uh, a lot of other entities. I mean, we've been working on it for quite some time, but with the implementation, I think a lot of uh, parties will, uh, will see more of the network code. So it's definitely, of course, the TSOs, DSOs that will, will see the network code. But also NSUI, EU DSO entity, they get new responsibilities. European entities, Acer and ANISA will get new tasks. There will be new national regulators appointed for network code. And also, a lot of other parts in, in the electricity sector will be affected. So it will be producers, aggregators, NEMOs, basically anyone who can affect the network code will yeah, come into contact with it uh, probably next year. So what, what will they be doing? So there's quite a package of measures coming up. Uh, we'll be doing risk management, cybersecurity risk management at the European level, at member state level, and also at entity level. So at all levels, we will have risk management. There will be some mandatory cybersecurity controls coming for everyone, and these will include specific controls also for supply chains. We will prepare for European cybersecurity certification schemes in the electricity sector by providing, by providing recommendations on them. Um, there will be a um, Obligation to report incidents, but with it also comes increased information sharing, so that the information from incidents will not just be gathered, but it will be shared with the community to have better threat intelligence. 
Um, and these will have to prepare for instant response and, and crisis management, and there will also be exercises at, at a regional, at member state and entity level to practice all these new skills. So there's quite a bit coming up. And I think that will also be my first question to the, the members of the panel. So, I mean, there's a lot of measures coming up. Um, yeah, what do you think will have the most effect in improving the cybersecurity in the electricity sector? And, and what measures do you see could pose possible problems in the, or challenges in the implementation? So, Dijk, I could ask you to start with your action. Absolutely. It is actually my, my pleasure to start with this very complex and, and partially also unfair question because I, I believe that all the measures within the network code aim at the cybersecurity landscape in Europe. And our network code and cybersecurity project team and the wider TSO community, and I'm very confident also DSO community, believes in each one of the requirements mentioned in the network code. But nevertheless, there are a few things that are important to mention uh, and, uh, and interesting to mention. And one of them is that network code and cybersecurity aims at the reliability of the electricity system regarding the cross-border electricity flows. And what reli reliability means, it also means um, resilience. So that means ability to adapt in time and the changing uh, digital developments. It means uh, the ability to, to shift and shape uh, based on the situation that we are in. And I think that already on its own is a quite a significant achievement. And it's, as you mentioned, it's the first steps and there will be much more in the future to be, uh, to be done in regards of this. But more on the practical aspects, it's important to mention all the methodologies that will be developed after the entry into force of the network code. And this will ensure a more practical grasp on things. So it's even more moving from the discussion points into a more uh, practical putting on paper know-how by the experts of the community. And not only TSO and DSO, but the wider stakeholder community. So this actually creates this interesting framework that the network code uh, creates. Is It's a meeting hub for various stakeholders and everyone comes together with a common goal, which is not often, often seen, I would say. And this common goal is to keep the good guys in, keep the bad guys out, keep the lights on, and ensure that our collaboration stretches even further than uh, only political aspects, but also practical really hard on cyber technical expertise. So that is, uh, that is really, really fascinating that I think for the cyber community, for the electricity community, the network code is bringing. Um, also, it is important to, to mention that the network code really aims at harmonizing uh, the capabilities in the field. For example, by establishing the minimum and advanced cybersecurity controls, which will ensure that the big players and the small players have uh, the, the kind of the ground that is fair and consistent and equal. So that uh, should not be taken for granted. It will also establish risk assessment and treatment procedures and processes, and this will tackle what our team often refers to, we are as strong as our weakest link. When it comes to challenges, so that's uh, another thing. And I, I, I personally think there are as many challenges as there are benefits, but challenges does not mean uh, that it's necessarily a bad thing. Challenges allow us to learn, grow, develop, shape and shift. So at the end, they kind of become opportunities. And if we look at the opportunities to learn, there are several. We have done that for the past decades, if not more, but I see us continuing to learn to integrate and ensure that we do have this member support from all the associations and from our stakeholders that participate in, in the drafting of the methodologies, but also in the future implementation phase. So that is at its core of every activity, also when we look from more high level, not only for the network code. Another, uh, I think, opportunity to learn, but also, uh, in other words, challenge, is understanding what exactly network code will require. And that will take uh, quite some time. And also understanding what kind of resources each entity will need to have to implement this network code. And these things seem very 
evident and obvious uh, in, in, in every discussion on every project, but they should not be taken for granted because that itself will take the time on its own. And uh, this is why NSOE already this year uh, puts practical steps in place, collaborating with EU DSO entity, bringing the TSO and DSO community together, but as well other stakeholders to ensure that we start these discussions on a timely manner. So we don't wait until the implementation process is there, but we get rid of some of the difficult discussions already now. Okay, thank you very much. Can I then ask Olivier to react from this on this from the EU DSO uh, perspective? Yes, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I'm going to talk for EU DSO entity. So I just resume who is uh, EU DSO entity. EU DSO entity is the organization in charge to represent all DSOs in Europe, uh, irrespective of their size and type. Uh, the DSO entity has been legally set up by European regulation approved in 2019 and uh, the DSO entity was created uh, a year ago. So to answer to your question uh, about the measure, just like Daiga, I don't think that there is uh, only one measure uh, that is going to, to, to change everything in cybersecurity for the electric sector. I don't believe in the silver bullet uh, that is going to, to, to solve everything. Uh, I think that just like Daiga said, uh, it's quite unfair to, to go just after Daiga. Um, there is all the measures are really important and we should uh, follow all of them and we should just implement everything. Uh, so this is really something that uh, we, I really believe. When it comes to challenges, I think it's, um, I just would like to come back to the DSO situation. Um, there is a quite um, wide range of DSOs in Europe. There is some very big one, just like uh, NEDIS, just like the one I'm working for. Um, pretty mature in cybersecurity because we had the NIS directive and uh, we implement a lot of things in, uh, in, uh, in, our country, in our company. But there is also some very small DSOs with some dozens of employees, hundreds of uh, customers, so really small one. Does they have an IT manager? Maybe. Do they have some cybersecurity manager? I'm not sure. And between these two kind of DSOs, the big one and the small one, we will have the threshold uh, saying, okay, this is a high impact or critical impact entities that will have to, Im to, to implement the network code. And I think that the DSOs that are going to be just a little bit higher than this threshold will have a lot of investment to be made investment in time, investment in money, and it's going to be very difficult for them. Maybe the investment and um, the what will require the uh, network code to do will impact directly uh, that kind of DSOs, and we should be very careful to them because it's going to be very difficult for them. Uh, it's going to be much more difficult than for some big entities just like TSOs or the big, uh, big DSOs. So here it is. <laughs> Okay, okay, thank you very much. Uh, then, then we'll switch to online. So ask uh, Thomas, also from the DSO perspective, representing EDSO, wh what is your view? So wh what, would, what are the measures you expect most from and what do you see as the, the challenges? Okay, thank you, Martin. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm very happy to be here with you today. And uh, I would like to thank you, the EDSO, ENCS, and SOE to organize this, this meeting and invite me to, to provide you some uh, information from EU DSO perspective for the network code. So as uh, already mentioned here uh, in, uh, in uh, previous section, the uh, cybersecurity situation in energy sector has been changing in recent years. So we sh knew, uh, all knew about the uh, cybersecurity attacks at the Ukraine and, and etc. So I think that the, the network code will uh, provide the, uh, or ensure the uniform rules and address uh, the various key areas for increasing the level of cybersecurity, especially for cross-border electricity flows. And uh, as Daiga said, and also Olivier, uh, from my point of view, I think that uh, there are several main areas which are especially important to be addressed 
So uh, the first of all is a uh, uh, complete and uh, go uh, governance for the cybersecurity risk management. So we can uh, provide in network code a complete process how to deal with the cybersecurity risk uh, management and cybersecurity risk assessment from the uh, NSOE and the EU DSO perspective uh, to the entities, which is EU DSO and also, also the TSOs. And the second main area, which is from EU DSO uh, perspective, uh, I think quite uh, quite important is that the network code establish mm -hmm. uh, national uh, competent authorities for the purpose of ensure the implementation supervision of the network codes and this authority can provide the relevant information to to the uh, entities like UDSOs and and uh, TSOs and the third main area which I think will, will be the uh, big impact to uh, provide the cybersecurity uh, requirements and its improve improvements as uh, the specifi specification of minimum and advanced cybersecurity supply chain security controls. So I think that is the, maybe the from uh, EU DSO perspective, the main uh, big uh, changes, but um, <laughs> who knows? About some uh, worries about implementation from EU DSO perspective, I agree with Olivier, because as, as he said, there are a lot of big EU DSOs, which uh, typically has uh, implemented some, uh, for example, information security management system. So they have implemented processes. They have uh, uh, propagation of cybersecurity procurements requirements to subcontractors and uh, maybe all uh, things which network codes specify. But on the other hand, there are a lot of small EU DSOs and there will be maybe the uh, impact to the personal capacities, to the, to the uh, budgets or the uh, financial, financial situation. So I think there will be a quite uh, interesting uh, to look how the EU DSOs will implement the network codes. That's from my perspective. Okay, okay, thank you very much, Thomas. Um, so we'll, we'll next go to Stefano, but before that, after Stefano, we will go to the Q&A session. So if you already have questions, you can, can already put them online. I think there, there's a QR code that you can use, it's the same mechanism as this morning. So if you have, you can already put them in. So. Uh, to close, we'll go to uh, Stefano Brocco to for the regulator side. So, Stefano, uh, do you have any favorites in the measures that are network codes or any particular things where you see challenges? Yeah, as you know, I have a number, but let's go uh, in order. First, uh, I would say that among the measures, I would distinguish those that are mainly hanging fluids and we may expect in the uh, short, medium term and those who I would expect to come uh, in the medium long term for different reasons. Let's go the the ones that I expect would, uh, and I hope that will come first uh, for many reasons. Uh, the first one is uh, all the parts regarding cyber resilience and exercises. And this is just uh, my wish that people would uh, understand the value that is behind that framework uh, uh, in terms of uh, giving knowledge and giving possibility to people to understand uh, how we work from a digital perspective. Uh, I have, uh, I mean, I've been doing several of them and I must admit that I learned much more from those than reading a lot of books at the end of the day. 
Also, it's important to understand that uh, uh, many people think that they will have uh, an effect on uh, short term, but in reality, it is not the case. If uh, exercises are done properly, what happens is that uh, first you do it in a controlled environment. Second, you learn how you would uh, uh, behave in an hostile environment. That is the one where we are right now, if you look to what is outside. Uh, and uh, also it allows to build up uh, contacts and knowledge of other people and to build much more the community. People don't give it for granted that we are a, a closed community. The reality is that uh, uh, the first incident we will face, and I always hope that it will be uh, as late as possible, let's say, uh, basically we would need to learn the art time uh, who is leading and who is sitting on the back seat and just doing things. It's better if we experience in a, a controlled environment, in my opinion. But also, uh, that is a very good way to learn the phenomenon by just practicing and not only on a theoretical basis. On medium term, my hope is that the minimum standards uh, will just have uh, uh, a real impact on uh, uh, critical and high impact entities. Now, let's be honest. Uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, all the entities have already, let's say 70, 80% of what will be in those standards. Nevertheless, it's important that uh, we check that this is happening that we are sure that everybody is paying its own share to the implementation. Because uh, as we have said uh, many times, uh, the weaker, weakest list link is the one that will be attacked at a certain point. So we need to make sure that those will be implemented, uh, even though we know that it will take time. Uh, and this is, is, this is also another uh, point that I want to make. Uh, time that has been given into the network code has been given because we all understand that it cannot be switched off uh, or switched on in this case from a day to another. Also, another point I want to make, standards will need fine tuning because the implementation uh, despite many people think that it, it's just a piece of hardware that we will put there. No, it's not like that. It doesn't work like that on the grid because we need to fine tune also the operational layer that it's not fine tuned with all those measures that are not yet in place. One last thing I want to say uh, about the supply chain. This is uh, much bit longer. Uh, in time. And I think that, and I hope that people will understand this. And this is physiological. If you think that to penetrate the supply chain took several years, uh, we, could, we cannot expect that we will fix just in six months. It's simply unreasonable. But obviously, we need to start with the right mood and with the right objectives. Uh, and it's important that we do that. So, from uh, a point of view, of uh, measures, I would say that supply chain uh, is uh, most probably the one that will come a bit later. Challenges. Uh, the big challenge is the governance, and this everybody understands. Uh, this is a concern, and uh, everybody asks, would we be able to cooperate? Who are those who have to cooperate? My point is that uh, uh, there are many different perspectives. Let's merge them. Let's put together and let's start talking even uh, unofficially we are already doing most of the times. We know each other. I know most of the people who, who, who I have seen today. Uh, we need to talk about the problems. We need to be open and to share. And we need to do it fast, quick and efficiently any opportunity that we have. And this is my last statement, I would say. Okay, okay. Thank, thank you very much. So. I guess summarizing everyone is, is very happy with the whole package of, of measures. So a lot is coming up, but I think it seems to be a well-coordinated set of things. Um, so we'll now be going into the, the Q&A session. So I said, if you have questions, please put them um, in the, or <laughs> share them with us. Um, I would like to start with one question from my side. So um, 
I if you read the network code, there's a lot of work coming for ENSWE and the EU DSO entity. It, it's, uh, for instance, they will have to do the uh, European and regional risk assessment, not just once, but every three years. Uh, they will coordinate some of the exercises. There's uh, like five different methodologies that need to be developed. Uh, so it's already challenging. And also it's the first time, if it's one of the first topics where EU DSO and ENSWE will actually be collaborating. Um, I think Daig already said, well, we're, we're not going to wait, we will not wait, we're actually going to do something. Could, could you elaborate a bit about how you are preparing for these, these new responsibilities? Absolutely. So, uh, as mentioned, our cyber experts were born to be ready. Uh, but jokes aside, in practice, we do put a lot of effort, we do put a lot of work uh, in preparing ourselves for what's coming. So one practical example, we have established uh, a joint TSO and DSO project team that works uh, on, on various technical aspects, discussing amongst themselves on the possibilities that the network code will bring. Again, it's important to remember that the network code is not yet adopted. It's, it will come, it will enter into force uh, most likely only next year. Nevertheless, these discussions, as mentioned earlier, have to take place already in advance. And to do that, it is not sufficient only to have, of course, the TSO and DSO community. It also means involving various stakeholders. And this is something we have uh, started uh, through mainly associations uh, of various representatives to have these technical discussions and, and receive this feedback. Um, if you're interested, I would like to welcome everyone to visit NSOE website. You can find more information about stakeholder engagement there uh, and, and ways to contact our team. Uh, but more looking at the NSOE side, um, we have made a um, detailed multi-year and resource planning. So we've spent quite many hours sitting down and, and planning what would be needed, uh, both from Secretariat, but also from our members. Uh, so we would be ready to take up this, uh, this, this actually huge responsibility that we will have. Uh, our hope currently is that NSOE would become uh, a meeting hub for everyone who wants to talk cyber. So not only TSO community, but we would really establish a proper uh, environment where we could all gather. Uh, NCE is entrusted uh, with this responsibility that we really uh, are happy and humble to, to, to receive. But uh, we should not forget that it would not be possible without our friends and colleagues that are here today with me on the panel, but also listening online. Um, NCE has a long-lasting experience when it comes to participating, drafting in the network codes, having uh, various structures in places like working groups, um, committees that was earlier mentioned also by, also by Gianluca, newly established ICT committee responsible for uh, cybersecurity uh, topics as well. Uh, we have various applications and tools that have ensured the continuity of the grid operations. We do have uh, in uh, NCE Secretariat more than 140 uh, experts on various topics, thousands of member lists of, of TSOs. So all of the its and pieces are already there, but the biggest issue now is how to do it efficiently. So okay, we have a lot of resources, but now what? How to do it? And the rest is already there. So I think this, this really focus on efficiency is the primary thing. And finding the best scope, learning from the previous experiences, but also keeping a fresh mind. And, uh, and, and as you mentioned, and, and finding the best ground how to work together, TSOs and DSOs, but as well various stakeholders in this changing environment. So I think that is going to take a bit of time, uh, and I'm very happy we already have that project team in place, which is a very good touch base for the future to come. Well, <coughs> maybe if I can continue what you, what you are saying, I think definitely we need um, a lot of expertise, a lot of competence. We need a team, a team able to work together. Uh, when I'm talking about competence, I'm talking about some people who know what cybersecurity is, what electricity is. They need to be able to talk about the legal language, uh, to be able to transform what they, what they think in something uh, uh, readable uh, from a legal point of view. 
And we need also some people able to understand clearly what the network code is and to jump directly in one chapter or the other one and to be able to, to go deeply in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the concept that we, that we are developing. Um, so this is the kind of people that we really need. And we need also some people able to talk, able to challenge the ideas, able to, to say, okay, I don't agree with what you are saying, I have another point of view, I think we should go in this way or this way, to contradict themselves and to try to find the best way. Um, I see all around the project team a lot of people with a lot of experience. We should use that kind of experience, it's really important, and this is what we are doing. Uh, we, are, we are definitely a, a, a strong team. This is, I think, the best way to prepare ourselves uh, for the next step, to have a strong team able to to answer quickly uh, to the, uh, the challenges that we're going to have as soon as the, uh, the network code is implemented, in hopefully in beginning of uh, 2023. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much. So it looks like you need to already sort of quite uh, well used to collaboration and, and start us already on some things, so that, that's very good. Uh, I see there's, there's already one question from the, the audience. So again, if, if you have questions, please, please send them to us. So the question is from uh, Thierry Pollet from Hitachi Energy. Uh, his question is, Article 36 of Network Code speaks about certification. How will this be implemented in terms of which certifications to be complied with and to which maturity level and within what timeline? Um, so just <coughs> for the people who don't know all the articles by heart, so Article 36 uh, speaks about uh, recommendations or guidance on European cybersecurity certification schemes. I think these are the, the schemes that will be developed under NISA, under the Cybersecurity Act. So the, the goal of Network Code is not to develop new schemes, but basically to provide guidance on how existing schemes will be um, implemented in the electricity sector. And also, please be careful, it's guidance, so it's not, not mandatory, it, it's sort of uh, to help entities meet the supply chain uh, directives. I don't know, Olivier, do you want to give maybe an... Uh Extension or no? I think I think please continue. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know much more than me. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think I, maybe Thomas Stefano. Do you have any additions to to this? Yeah. Uh, basically, the, the article says pretty clearly that uh, uh, the idea would be to use the European uh, certification. So what we have under the Cybersecurity Act, if uh, uh, this will be available. Uh, this has been done on purpose. From one side, uh, to uh, use whatever we had uh, uh, already done by others, for example, in this case, by ENISA, by the different committees. From the other side, to make sure that all the tools that uh, have been put in place, Cybersecurity Act, in future Cyber Resilience Act, they would uh, uh, be used even uh, and also by the network code. So the schemes, uh, uh, let's say the certification schemes uh, are those that now, maybe those that are now commonly used in future, most probably it will converge towards the European certification schemes uh, as soon as they will become available. Yeah, and I think maybe to answer the timeline question, the idea there is there will be a rolling work program for this. So the timelines will actually be set when network goes into force because we cannot cover all of the, the um, yeah, everything in scope of the TSOs, the ESOs, or other entities at the same time. So there will be sort of a roadmap for developing also this guidance in, in the future. Um, maybe also to continue on the supply chain question, I think it's funny we were talking about this. I mean, one of the focus areas that Acer also pointed out in the framework guidelines was the supply chain security. How do you think this is now uh, addressed in, in the uh, network code? And then um, and how, f how do you think that this will interact with other legislation, upcoming legislations like the uh, Cyber Resilience Act that you already mentioned? Okay, then let's go through this path. Uh, the, the supply chain basically is one part of the network code. Uh, it covers very partially the certification we have just said, uh, and it was done on purpose because uh, uh, we had in mind that anyway, the Cybersecurity Act would have been followed by other piece of legislation that would have operationalized what is in the Cybersecurity Act. 
Act. The Cyber Security Act, uh, for those who do not remember, basically it makes the reform of ENISA. In addition, it sets the cyber security uh, schemes that are a fundamental tool for everybody uh, just to certify. Uh, what is, has been done by and what hopefully it will be done by the Cyber Resilience Act that it's uh, uh, still under work, so it's not adopted, but uh, it's public, so we're not talking about anything that it's secret, is that it's going to operationalize those tools that are in the, uh, basically in the Cyber, uh, yeah, in the Cyber Security Act, okay? Now, uh, putting this together outfits uh, the network code. There were some spots, uh, important to say, okay? The Cyber Resilience Act, uh, what it covers is uh, security, cyber security of products and digital elements of the grid. Uh, what we have to understand is that uh, there are much more things that relate to uh, to the issue of supply chain that had to be solved. And this is something that uh, uh, has not been done by the Cyber Security Act, uh, has not been done uh, by the Cyber Resilience Act. So what, uh, in principle, uh, the Network Code is doing is uh, adding elements to the supply chain. One example is, for example, there are guidelines for procurement that are mentioned. There are additional measures about supply chain. For example, how you select your own providers, uh, the fact that they may become themselves entities uh, that are critical for the grid. All these aspects uh, were difficult to tackle in other regulations. So the idea has been uh, by most of us to embed them in the network code. So what the network code is doing is filling the gaps in respect to the sector, uh, but not overriding what is in those two regulations because it would have been uh, impossible legally. It's just secondary regulation. And uh, the other important thing is that Basically, we wanted really to use uh, at the best way possible whatever was already uh, on the table or whatever was in theory coming uh, on the skyline for all of us. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. Maybe then also t going from the supply chain back to, to sort of the scope of the network code, as, as I mentioned in the introduction, there will be a lot of entities in scope of the network code. Um, a question to, to Thomas first. Do, do you know which entities do you expect to be in scope of network code and, and what can these entities do to prepare for it? Uh, so, so, like I mentioned, I th from my perspective, the uh, scope of the network code is uh, quite clear. So, I uh, expect that there will be a significant TSO and uh, DSO, uh, electricity market operators, uh, critical service providers, and, uh, and um, et cetera. So my perspective, as I said, I think it's the scope is uh, quite, uh, quite clear, uh, especially from the perspective of uh, EU DSOs. And, uh, but I do not, uh, I don't know if there will be some some sector specific or some uh, sp specific companies which uh, will uh, have to implement the uh, specific requirements of the of the network codes. So maybe if uh, if Daiga or Olivier or Stefano can uh, can uh, have some additional information about about the scope. Uh, I will be glad to do another opinion. So first go to uh, Daiga, we have some additions. Thank you. No, I, I would uh, really only compliment what was what was mentioned before, uh, because some some identification of which entities will be in the scope are already mentioned in Article Two, and indeed it mentions the NCOE, EU DSO, but it also mentions C certs, uh, MSSPs, NEMOs, Acer, NRAs, NCAs, and so forth. But it also talks about any other 
entity or party that will fall under the high impact or critical impact entity. But that will be only established uh, and, and, and finalized after entry into force of the, of the network code. Nevertheless, as mentioned by Thomas, uh, I think many of the entities already have a good grasp uh, or the feeling of the criticality within their member state uh, that, that they have. Uh, but nevertheless, um, uh, this is nothing revolutionary that the network code puts in place. It's actually more of establishing structure. So I would say that you know there is this good grasp, as, as Thomas mentioned, but there's also uh, just a, a logical uh, structural uh, procedures put in place. But I would say there is nothing to necessarily fear from. Okay. Um, so I, th I think b all of you mentioned there, there's quite a number of different entities in scope. And you also mentioned in passing sort of they will be classified in high impact and critical impact entities. So not all measures apply to all entities, but it depends on its classification. Uh, for this classification, there will be something used called the European or el Electricity Cybersecurity Impact Indices, the ECII. Uh, I think this was one of the innovations in the, the framework guidelines. Maybe, Stefano, can you explain a bit why you think these, these ECI are necessary or important and, and how you, uh, you think they, sh they should work or expect them to work? Okay, the, the idea came out uh, for uh, several reasons. Uh, when we wrote uh, the framework guidelines, what was interesting was that people started listing a number of parameters that they would have loved to have uh, in the list of those to consider uh, high impact uh, or important. A and this was uh, uh, the first step. We try, uh, my first reaction was uh, uh, we most probably need an index. We won't be able to cope with the fact that we need uh, 10, 15, 20, 40 different uh, parameters to screen all these companies and would not have been even fair because it would have been waiting things uh, uh, in my opinion in the wrong way. Therefore we went for the ECII that uh, are nothing else than uh, a synthesis of the concept of these parameters. Basically they can be put together and uh, what you have is a value uh, or several values because then uh, we, we add the plural uh, during one of the revisions. Uh, the interesting part is that uh, those values are anyway based uh, on a number of flexible parameters. Article 17 is pretty clear uh, when it talks about those parameters. Loss of load, reduction of power generation, loss of capacity in the primary frequency reserve, loss of capacity for a black start. And then it opens to, two cate to one category that is uh, the duration of outage that was the last added and we had uh, any other quantitative or qualitative criteria. This was done uh, for another reason, that we feared that during the risk assessment and when we would have set all the system, we would have had the need to adjust and to uh, reweight uh, which was the weight uh, of uh, each of these parameters. The easy way to do that was to have an index that would have had given us the possibility basically to uh, touch base and to understand uh, which would have been the, the new threshold. Now, the, the ECII is what they do is they basically uh, allow us to understand which is the threshold below or above which you fall under one or the other category. And this is pretty important because this simple uh, value basically gives you a guidance. It's agnostic. So it doesn't talk about politics, it doesn't talk about feelings, uh, except if we then uh, make comments that the, when it's uh, uh, qualitative, uh, we may have different views on the interpretation. I would agree, but this is something for further discussion when we will have started the implementation. Uh, and it's fair, because on the other side, we wanted, uh, we wanted really to have uh, a tool that would allow to say you are in this category, but because of these specific risks that you run into. That may depend from market, may depend from the fact that you have certain technology. This has been put in a single param in a single or few very parameters that would allow to distinguish and to take a decision. It was also a simplification for the uh, 
national competent authorities that uh, most probably uh, would have not been able to gather thousands of information and cope with the very complex decisions. So it's also a, a let's say a simple decision tool at the end of the day. Okay, okay, thanks a lot. So, so besides the ECI, uh, we have now a question about something else. So there's also the ECSMM, the Electricity Controls to Standards Mapping Matrix. Uh, and the question was, could you provide further information on how this Electricity Controls to Standards Mapping Matrix uh, will work, especially in terms of the validity and implication for national regulation on cybersecurity systems? Because uh, like this matrix, I think it maps the, the minimum and advanced cybersecurity controls both the international standards, but also national regulation. And the question, does it have any impact, for instance, on the validity of national regulation? I think also the ECSMM was one of the, the ACER innovations and framework guidelines. Can I pass it again to you, uh, Stefano? Yeah, uh, with pleasure. Okay, the idea was exactly not to interfere with national regulation, to give the possibility, if you fulfill a certain requirement under national regulation, uh, to fulfill also the minimum requirements uh, under the network code, uh, without putting the obligation to follow a standard. Because the fear was uh, what we will do at a certain point if we will have uh, just standards. And if the standards won't match one to one with uh, national regulation, should I redo things? Should I go for a certification to get uh, the the, certif the certificate that I fulfill uh, that standard? So we had uh, the idea to have this mapping exactly to avoid that and to give also the freedom to national competent authorities to flag that they were already doing work with uh, all the regulatory authorities and with all other people and they took a decision that certain kind of measures has to implement it in a certain way and it is in law and it's not in a standard this was the general idea it was uh, again a simplification for everybody not to do the work twice because uh, this is something that uh, uh, we really took care of as like uh, all other participants, and so UDSO and all the others really took care to minimize the efforts, uh, but still to do the effort uh, and to take care of what is already uh, there in terms of regulation and standards. Okay, so to summarize, it's, it's there to help entities, it's not there to override any national regulation. No, I mean, that's in, what in theory, is. if uh, national regulation can be mapped, uh, to one of the requirements uh, that specific requirement is already fulfilled. So there is no need to redo it because somebody has mentioned another standard because they correspond one, they match one to one. Okay, okay, thanks a lot. Um, I want to come back a bit on the, the risk assessment. So there's a lot of risk assessment in the, the network code. So there's a, a union-wide risk assessment that's used to determine the scope. So which entities are in scope, but also uh, which part of an entity is in scope. Uh, there are risk assessments for entities at member states, at regional level. So I think there, there's four different types of risk assessment going on, which will, as we discussed before, have a lot of work. Um, but what do you see as the advantages of, of this approach for the network code? Uh, can I maybe uh, ask Olivier first? Mm. Or Daiga first. Daiga first? She's okay, she's you were coordinated. No, very good, very good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, what a gentleman. <laughs> Uh, no, when we look at the, the risk assessments, indeed, there are various layers, but they are there for a reason. And I think with with our team, uh, we had quite a lot of debates on, on, on these, these parts specifically. So if we look at the union-wide um, risk assessment, it is more of a micro level or top-down approach uh, that has this kind of a helicopter view on the ho or holistic view on the, the risks uh, that are very important for the cross-border uh, cybersecurity. Uh, when we look at the regional, I would say it's more of a micro or bottom-up approach that looks at really specific uh, risks or identifies specific risks for all the regions, but also for uh, certain specific um, regions. So when uh, we look at this, then this regional or this, this micro level uh, really is a sum of all identified regional risks that then can be used for this top-down approach or this union-wide approach. 
So it's really complementary, and this uh, union-wide uh, approach would be done still through the work of Cybersecurity Risk Working Group, uh, where uh, and so in EU DSO entity with the co-chair, but also with various stakeholders. So you have this kind of overall overarching governing structure, but you also really have hands-on regional experience that uh, that has this uh, vision of of, of the, the risks uh, and, and the treatments for, for this level. So when we look at this uh, disadvantages, maybe an advantages point, so the dis disadvantages that the regional uh, risk assessment would then identify many risks that might really not serve the purpose for the union-wide risk assessment. So would uh, focus on these candidate business processes that are not cross-border uh, in nature, while the union-wide would have maybe too holistic view and would not understand the, the risks and business processes identified at the regional level. So the golden line is in the middle where you do have both, where the bottom up or the regional risk assessment uh, phases feed into the top down or this union wide and vice versa. So this communication line is, is very important and I'm quite sure that uh, Olivier will uh, complement yeah. uh, to more maybe in practice experience as well as being in the field. Yeah, this risk assessment approach is really important. This is something really a concept really important in cybersecurity. So this is really something that everyone in cybersecurity will, will follow. So um, this is something really, this is an advantage. Everybody know about this risk assessment. Everybody is going to participate to this risk assessment of the, the bottom up uh, risk assessment. Everybody will bring his, uh, his, uh, his value in the, in the, the whole chain. So it's, it's, really, it's really good. The disadvantage, just like you mentioned, there will be a lot of entities which are going to participate to this. So if we have a lot of, of, um, of entities participating in, in, this, in this risk assessment, it, it means that it's going to take a long time um, to get all these risk assessments and after to, 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 to get all that at national level and then at the regional level. So it could be some disadvantage about that. Okay. Okay, thank you. Again, if there's any questions, please, please sh share them with us. But I'll just continue with the questions that, that we have uh, prepared. Um, one question is to Olivier. I think when, when I read the network code, one thing that always surprises me are the, the timelines for reporting. So there is one thing, for instance, that an entity would have to report an incident in four hours. And I think what surprised me even more is that the TSOs and DSOs put that in voluntarily. I mean, usually people try to <laughs> delay this, but you actually advocated for, for making very short timelines. Can you, can you explain why this was so yeah. important to you and the rest of the I team? I, I still don't understand why you <laughs> don't understand, <laughs> Martin. <laughs> but I will explain one more time. <laughs> it's my pleasure, definitely. No, when we are talking about the four hours, we should not focus on the four hours. Because the four hours, of course, it will start at one time, it will and it will stop at one time, four hours. But we should not look only at the time it's going to stop, but we look at the time it's going to start, th when the clock starts. So the clock starts within two conditions. The first one, the entity will have to um, sufficiently scope uh, the, the, the incident to say, okay, this is a high incident, I, uh, the, the assets considered are really important, and we have to be very careful because here it could turn bad. The second, the second condition is to say, okay, the authorized representative of the entity, this is exactly in the network code, um, confirm this classification. So this is the two conditions to say, okay, the clock starts. This is something really important. And then, yes, I fully agree with you, the entity have four hours to send the information to the National Competent Authority, the, CSN, uh, the, 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 C the NCCS and CA, sorry. So, but when, we start when the information is sent to the NCCS NCA. Uh, we have to consider also the, NCCS, the NCCS NCA will have a lot of things to do. The first, it, it will have to share the information to the other member states. As soon as the NCCS NCA have inf enough information, that means that the information is clear enough to be shared with some other entities. And as soon as the NCCS NCA consider, consider that the information can be shared and won't create any damage, any more damage. 
So this is two conditions also that the NCCS is going to share it with the other NCCS NCS at European level. And then the NCCS NCS are supposed to share the information to all the electricity entities in all the uh, European countries. So this is all the, uh, the, the chain. I think we should not look only at the four hours to send information. This is the price to pay. But this is also, we should look at the information that are going to be shared with all the electricity entities. This is really important. But why do we, see, do we think it's really important to share this information in four hours? So the four hours, we understand, is just as soon as we consider the information is, is clear. If we share it quickly to our authority, we're going to receive some support from our authority. This is also in the network code. The authority, the NCCS NCA, is supposed to bring us some support if we are in something quite difficult position. Two, the NCCS NCA is supposed to organize the defense at European level. What does it mean? It means that they are supposed to proactively verifying and finding any of those similar cybersecurity incidents, correlate the in information in order to enrich existing information, and strengthen and coordinate cybersecurity response. So you see, the NCCS NCA will have to share the information with the other NCCS NCAs, and then uh, they should be able to see if there is no other in, um, incident in Europe, just like the same that you are, you, are, you are facing at this moment, and then to find some information for you to be able to, to, to get some solution. And three, they have to provide the information to all the other entities, so it's also really important to prepare the defense for all the other entities. So you share it quickly, yes, definitely, but in fact, you should not look that you're going to share it in four hours, but you should, you should understand that we're going to receive a lot of information about the incidents all over Europe. It's something that really, really be we believe we should, we should get. And this okay. morning, we talked a lot about that. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah, I think I finally understand after <laughs> five times, so <laughs> I, I promise not to ask it, uh, <laughs> ask it again. I think uh, we, we have one question from the audience. Um, I, I would, hello, I'd like, uh, this is from P. Vatsalaki. I would like to ask if the risk assessment methodologies uh, and relevant guidelines standards to be followed will be provided uh, to the TSOs. So I, th I think some work's already ongoing in the certification subgroup as part of the transitional s list of standards. Can I, can you elaborate on this, Daigo? Or the short answer is yes. yes. <laughs> now, indeed, there is some work already done. Uh, it's ongoing. Uh, I would suggest you to to uh, feel free to contact me at any time. But I have even better news. They will not only be shared with the TSO and DSO community as well, but we will also be the ones uh, drafting it after entry into force of the network code. So, so you will have a real experience and hands-on uh, ability to influence these methodologies and guidelines but as mentioned from TSO, DSO community, but also from the stakeholder perspective. Because if we look at the uh, one of the requirements that currently in the current version of the network code is the establishment of cybersecurity risk working group that would gather experts and knowledgeable on-field on experts for this sole purpose to, to work together, to brainstorm, and to ensure that the, the wider community is well aware of these guidelines, measures, and that they're practice in practice uh, well used and and, and, and applicable. Uh, so I would uh, I would say it's even a better a better news than the question itself. Okay, thank you very much. So I ho hope we answered that well. So I think we have time for for one last question. I think this is related to the uh, standards mapping matrix. So I'll ask it to Stefano. Uh, it's from Matthias Skrempel. It says usually we pursue European standards and adopt them at the national level. Why not with the TSOs and DSOs? So why are we sort of going the other way around with the st uh, standards mapping matrix? Stefano? Can you repeat the question? So I think the question is, n in a lot of other sectors, these standards are developed first at European level and then adapted at the national level. Here we're sort of working the other way around in that we, in the standards mapping matrix, we take the national legislation and try to map it to the European standards. Why do we take this approach and not the other way around? <laughs> uh, simply because many regulations already exist. 
and uh, obviously we couldn't uh, do re the reverse. It would have been great to have uh, everything set uh, in uh, cybersecurity regulation for energy, but that cybersecurity regulation doesn't exist, and it's the network code. Therefore, since we have many pieces that have been done already by the national competent authorities for cybersecurity, we found it uh, uh, more ideal for everybody to do it. Uh, we didn't mention national standards because most of the times when we talk about uh, national standards, uh, uh, the translation, let's say, the, the transposition between the European and international to national changes very little. Uh, therefore, we give it for granted that 95% uh, I think I've never seen a security standards where they, when the divergence is more, uh, is already contained in European and international standards. That is the the part of interest. Uh, but one other way to read it is also that uh, if you see any gap in all these, obviously you may ask uh, uh, to your national competent authorities to introduce some requirements in the national regulation is what I would suggest, because if there is any specificity that uh, it's not marked and cannot be marked at European level, it would be easier to adopt a regulation at national level or just an implementing act uh, or how you call it uh, at national level than at European level. This was also the, the other point that I want to make to make sure that everybody understands that the system has been done to be as flexible as possible to allow standards to survive, regulation to survive, standards to survive and to cooperate at the best way possible. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I'm happy we could close on, on an easy question. So it's it's uh, time also to wrap up. So if I think to, to summarize, so there is a lot of things coming up, but I think a lot of good things that will improve the cybersecurity in, in the Europe, European grid. So the risk assessments, the exercises, the minimum advanced control supply chains, a lot of things will happen in the coming years that will hopefully really raise the level of cybersecurity for everyone uh, involved in the electricity grid. I think there will be a lot of work, uh, not just for NCE, EDSO, but I think for all entities involved. Uh, but I think we can also handle it if we work well together, if we have good collaboration. Uh, I've been very happy, very en enjoying the collaboration with all the panelists up to now. And I hope also to work together with some of you already in the call to, to make this network code into a success in the future. So thank you very much. And then I hand over to... We have a bit more time, so yeah, so. <laughs> From the backstage, uh, let's say we have got a, a, a small problem, yeah? Ah, okay. Because uh, uh, the member of the commission to deliver the uh, conclusions of, of this has not yet arrived. So <laughs> it's not, <laughs> she's there. So sorry, sorry, <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> but uh, but uh, why, uh, why, why I, I was told that? Uh, it's okay, well, it's my bad, my bad, my bad, my bad, my bad, my bad. Okay. So you have uh, absolutely. You you can come come here, and uh, uh, sorry, I I did completely. <laughs> exactly. That's it. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, thank you very much, Dan, and uh, uh, <coughs> I was told one minute ago, but uh, well, well, well. <laughs> we'll see, <laughs> who knows. Yes. Um, <coughs> what, uh, um, what can you, uh, can you, can you say that um, maybe can be commented also by, by the panel? I, I will ask the panel to stay here for, uh, for the conclusions. Huh? Okay. Okay? Yep. May I give you over the, okay. the microphone? Yes, please, yes. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Sorry. No, <very> for everybody. <laughs> so, well, thank you very much for, <laughs> for giving me the, um, the possibility to make the closing remarks. And of course, I, I have to take my laptop as I'm very used to it for over the whole last years to talk just into my laptop and not to talk to people anymore. But nevertheless, I also took lots of notes. So therefore, because I think it was a very fruitful and very interesting event today. 
And I would like to thank NCOE, ENCS, and ETSO for the organization of this event and to bring forward this important topic every year and already five years in a row. So currently, we go, we're going through an energy crisis that uh, threatens not only our climate goals, but also energy security and also our independence, all in one. And besides the cuts of gas, imports from Russia, we also witness attacks on our critical infrastructure and an increased cyber activity. So without a doubt, energy um, is the energy infrastructure is the most <laughs> critical infrastructure that others depend upon. And energy is more important than ever because now it's also used as a weapon. So what we learned today or what I um, enjoyed listening to is really the key messages, so to say. In the opening session, we got reminded that cybersecurity is a key horizontal requirement for a secure and robust energy system. So we cannot copy IT security to OT security and that the interplay of actors is very important, not only in legislation, but also in the implementation. And I think that's also very important. In the panel discussion on cyber attacks, we learned that our European energy grid is in principle well protected. In principle, but also that incidents can happen and that they will happen. The protection of supply chains was raised several of times as it is a particular challenge. And this was also addressed that there we would need European law to address this. Of course, like all the time, we hear that education and training exercises are key. And also that we need to do more, that we need to do better, and that we need to do it together. For the synchronization of U Ukraine, I really learned a lot myself because this was a very great insight, so to say. So now I know that you need good luck, like always in life, the skills and resources, and also very good preparation. Um, and of course, the last panel now on the network code, <laughs> very, um, very interested. And I think you did it quite well with really showing a lot of content within the discussion and really explaining the parts very well. So um, I think that's what we will need to do in future as well. Um, and it was really good because um, we learned about the challenges. Of course, there are plenty. Um, like, for example, what we heard for small DSOs or also concerning the governance. But um, we learned also about the preparations which you already um, undertake for the implementation of the network code. And but there first of comes the adoption <laughs> of the network code. And that's where we are at the moment, actually. So um, currently, the draft undergoes legal review so by the commission. Um, then it will go into inter-service consultation, so which means we discuss it with all the different commission services. We had DG Connect today here in the morning. So therefore, um, we need to ensure that all our um, initiatives are aligned at the EU level. And then this will be followed by publication of the new text at Europa, translations and several other administrative steps. So the adoption is, of course, not any more planned for 2020-22, but for early 2023. And well, let me finish the um, conclusions today with my uh, main takeaway messages. So first of all, cybersecurity will stay in continuous effort. Then secondly, cybersecurity is too complex to do it on your own. And also fast information sharing and the need to share knowledge are really key. And so therefore, these are my closing remarks and I hand back to you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Michaela. And uh, uh, any supplementary questions for Michaela from uh, the panel? Maybe 
uh, thank you for the great collaboration and, and the thing that you mentioned, it's not only TSOs and DSOs, which we were uh, uh, communicating today, but we really worked very closely also with Acer and, and the colleagues, Stefano on the panel, but also with you, Michaela, and your colleagues. And this communication has been very much appreciated by our team, and it allows us to work in a transparent but also efficient way. And I think the main message of today was how to do it efficiently, and I think we're really heading the right direction. So thank you for that from our side. And thank you very much because the security of supply is uh, certainly what is your daily bread and butter, but it is also very much depending on what we have discussed today here. Thank you very much, and uh, my apologies for the little <laughs> one <laughs> quid pro quo before. So <coughs> next time uh, for, uh, for the moderator, a program with pictures, please. <laughs> because, <laughs> because it was years that uh, we, we, we didn't come across. And I even remember that uh, she was a moret, a brunette, and not a blonde. <laughs> so that is uh, uh, completely my fault. My apologies once again. So thank you very much for having attended this. Thank you very much also to the people on, uh, uh, online. Uh, we have not been abandoned by our online uh, public, uh, which is uh, rather exceptional for uh, this kind of uh, webinar. So after all these years of uh, presence on uh, the web and uh, on uh, the um, uh, webinar platforms. And thank you very much uh, uh, to those uh, who have come over here and uh, had the patience uh, to stay with us in uh, this uh, format that has proven to be quite uh, successful also for the good quality of our uh, panelists that have uh, uh, occupied these chairs over the day. Thank you very much again, and uh, have a safe, safe trip home, and see you for the sixth edition of this. It will be next year sometimes. I, uh, uh, we shall keep you posted. Bye-bye. <laughs>